My name is Carrie Diamond. I am the founder of Cherry Bomb and the host of Radio Cherry Bomb. And I'd like to welcome all of you to Hugs and Quiches, our demo that is part of the Julia Jubilee, our virtual celebration of the life and legacy of Julia Child. Um, I'm so excited for this demo. Uh, this features Molly Ye. Molly is the star of Girl Meets Farm and the author of Molly on the Range and Erin Jean McDell. Erin is the author of the best-selling cookbook, The Book on Pie, and she is an absolute authority on all things baking. Um, I'm totally out of breath because I ran and got my phone because <laughs> I didn't want to miss anything. Um, we love these two women at the Bomb Squad and we are so thrilled that they're doing this demo. Molly's going to be interviewing Erin Jean about life, her love of Julia Child and all things baking. And Erin Jean is going to walk us through her green veggie quiche. Um, and we're so excited that she's making this because for those of you out there who are Julia Child lovers, what's more quiche than Julia Child? So we're very excited to see how Erin has put a modern spin on green veggie quiche. Um, also, I will be popping back later on uh, to take everyone's questions. So I'm sure a lot of you know this already, but we've got a little Q&A box down there. So put your questions in the Q&A. Totally encourage you to chat in the chat with each other, um, but put your questions in the Q&A box so we don't miss them. And I know a lot of you have already done this and I saw all the, oh, I just saw Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, let us know where you're tuning in from because it's just really fun to see where on the globe you are zooming in with us. Um, before we start the demo, I would like to thank our sponsor for today's demo, and it's Whole Foods Market. Um, not all of you know this, but Cherry Bomb Jubilee started back in 2014. We wanted to do a conference that brought women together for networking, great conversations, beautiful food and drink. And we went to Whole Foods and we said, you know, would you like to sponsor this? And they had no idea what they were getting into, and they said yes, and they have supported Jubilee ever since. And we're so grateful for that. And they're part of the reason we've been able to make all this amazing programming free um, all week long for the Julia Jubilee. I would also like to talk about one thing in particular. So Whole Foods has this amazing program right now called Sourced for Good. And you can all see that sticker up there. This is the Sourced for Good asparagus that Erin Jean will be using uh, later in the demo. But Sourced for Good is a special seal that you'll find on hundreds of products at Whole Foods stores signifying support for worker welfare, communities, environmental stewardship, as verified by organizations including the Rainforest Alliance and Fair Trade America. So these values are important to me. We know these values are important to you. And we thought you'd appreciate knowing that such a seal and such a program exists. So the next time you go to Whole Foods Market, definitely look for that seal, all right? Um, okay, I am going to pass things over to Molly and to Erin Jean, and I can't wait to watch along and bake along with all of you. All right, I'll see you for the Q&A portion. Bye everybody. Hi. Hi, I'm so Hello. happy to see you. <laughs> I can see you, Erin, how are you? I'm so good, how are you? I, I'm i good now, I love, <laughs> I love you. It's so I much you. fun hanging out with you. I've been looking forward to this for so long. Me I too. love the Jubilee. I love this Cherry Bomb community and this, we're going to have so much fun. For sure. I said, it's going to be the smiliest session <laughs> that the Jubilee sees this year because you're like one of the only people I just like, I just seeing your face makes me smile, but also I know oh. I've already told you this, but for everybody else, my mom records Girl Meets Farm so we can watch it together when we're together. And we're only together a couple times a year. As of now, we haven't been together since 2019. So we are gonna have so much to catch up on when I see her in a few weeks. <laughs> I love your mom. What's up, Erin's mom? Erin, <laughs> um, I absolutely am like the biggest fangirl of you. And so much, like, it, and, and, what I love is you have so much joy that you bring to baking, to what you do, to teaching. And I see so many similarities between you and Julia in that regard. There is, sorry, I hope you didn't wear water or I hope you're wearing water from mascara, I'm sorry. Um, that was, that was a, a big drop and thank you so much for the compliment. I, I mean, I, of course, like Julia is this iconic, figure. I think we all grew up reading her books, watching her shows, and she was so 
joyful and so much herself and she had this passion for teaching and for food and when I read your books and when I watch your videos that I get that same feeling and so sorry to put you on the spot thank like you. that but no, I, thank you so much wow, I want I want to hear from you what your um what your love of Julia is all about so it's, first of all, thank you for such a lovely compliment. And I think, I think anybody who loves food feels a little bit of Julia in them. Like even, you know, I, I just, I think what you said is so true. It's that joyfulness, that desire to teach. And in fact, you'll forgive me because I'm such a Julia fan that I have like quotes that I, because there are just certain things that she has said that have really like inspired almost my entire career. Things that I read when I was really young that I was just like, oh my gosh, well then, yeah, that it just, and one of those things was that she once said, I learned a lot. I taught people a thing or two, but at the end of the day, it's what is really important isn't about if you're going to be remembered or, um, you know, that memory from people might fade. It's the individuals that you impacted along the way. And what I think is so funny is even in that quote, she says the memory, you know, might fade you, but of course her memory hasn't faded. And the reason it hasn't is because she touched so many individuals, like so many people carry those lessons. And for me, it started um, with my grandma, which is also where my love of pie comes from. So it's a good overlap. But my grandma loved watching Julia Child on PBS. And she would, um, it was a regular thing we would watch together when I was over there. And of course she would make us laugh and we would learn some things. And several times we even would be like we couldn't believe it, but we were just headed into the kitchen afterwards to like try something. And so um, one of the other things that, you know, I think there's a lot of, uh, I almost don't want to use this phrase, but that, that imposter syndrome that so many people feel, there's so many people in the food industry. And one of the things that she taught me from such an early time on is like, it's okay to make mistakes and mistakes are part of the learning process and that we're never really done learning you know, once you master French cuisine, once she mastered French cuisine, she was on to the next thing that she wanted to learn about and the next thing and the next thing. And that I think is something that really defines what I've carried with me of her through this, you know, through my whole career. And, and especially that making mistakes, because I think she once said something like, if you're not ready to fail, you're never going to learn to cook. And I, I love that. Because she has it's so that, true. Yeah, she has that relatability element that just makes you love her more and yeah and 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 in her cookbooks too that voice really comes through so so I guess your favorite quote isn't a party without a cake it's just oh I know, love that one it, we can change I, it to a party without a pie <laughs> oh I mean I'm I'm pro cake too as you know I mean I also love of course if you're afraid of butter use cream that's the classic other <laughs> Um, and you know, one of the, we were just watching actually, um, some clips of her and there's this one great clip in an episode where she's teaching about roast chicken, where she names all the different types of chickens, like all the sizes and uh -huh. she's introducing them almost like they're a band. She's like roaster, fryer, broiler. And they're all of my and friends. <laughs> and then she even gives the one that she picked. She's like, we're going to do the roaster. And she gives its measurements. She's like 14, 16, 14. <laughs> I, think, I think this is a good time to show you actually my favorite picture of Julia. It's not of her with um, a chicken, but she has this other friend. Do you have, do you have Julia Child and more company? Okay, I do. Do you, know what, I do. do you know which picture I'm about to show? Oh, this is yes. Julia with a 25 pound monkfish. Ah, uh, classic. And, and holding and, it. <laughs> yeah, just holding it. Like, here it is. Here's this fish that I got from my fishmonger. And now I'm going to show you how to cook it. Like, <laughs> I totally. And she knows how funny it is. I mean, like, that's something like this is not very relatable, but she realizes it. And that's why we <laughs> love her. And she said, she said that when they, they wheeled it on set, everybody screamed. And the fishmonger. <laughs> got into this giggling fit and it was just this whole thing and and um and and then she goes into what was inside the monkfish's stomach that it had eaten but anyway 
Um, Which that those reminds are kind of gems that she gives us too, to your point about being real life. It's like, yeah, this might even look like something that, you know, like to the camera crew, scary or whatever. And I'm yeah. going to show you exactly why it's not. And then at the end of it, I'm going to shove a big mouthful of it into my face and it's going to be delicious. <laughs> you know what she is. You know what she is. I'm going to plug your first book. She's fearless. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> she has my props. <laughs> She does um, have like a, 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 like she's, she talked about that too, about just, you know, trying new things, not being afraid to. And yeah. I think that, I mean, if she hadn't tried new things, we wouldn't be sitting here talking about her. You know, I mean, she yeah. didn't even know how to cook until she was um, the age that I am now, which is crazy. That, yeah, that blows my mind. And like, you, I was just thinking about this, right? What do you think Julia Child would be like if she had Instagram? Oh my gosh. See, don't you feel like she wouldn't have one? I feel like she might not have one. Okay. That's I, feel like she has, I could see so much FOMO coming about from like seeing her beautiful summers in France and <laughs> totally. you know, have, would Paul Child be an Instagram husband? Who knows? But she has, <laughs> she makes all of this beautiful food and, and she has this, um, just picturesque life but yeah but at the same time she has this relatability so I could see it being this hilarious account that is this juxtaposition of I actually love this comment that just came up they she they someone said she wouldn't but Paul would which would make <laughs> sense because he took so many photographs so he would probably run her Instagram account and would be somebody's, an Instagram husband somebody's gotta gotta create like a period Instagram account with Paul's old photos <laughs> but but updated captions Yes. Oh, that honestly, I mean, so when are we starting that? Is that let's right after this? Zoom? <laughs> um, okay. Do we, let's talk about her quiche because I have, um, I've made her quiche. I actually got to visit her old house in France, um, which is now a cooking school, um, run by this amazing woman named McKenna. And, um, and one of my biggest connections to Julia was, was when I got to visit when it first opened up and I made her quiche. I stood in front of her pegboard. Um, I, I watched her quiche, uh, episode a bunch of times to try to make it like her. And there were all of these little quirks that, I just, I, I got to recreate, it was so much fun. And so um, I'm excited to, to, to talk about her quiche and, to, and, and about your way of making quiche uh, because it's everyone, everyone loves quiche, right? <laughs> I mean, it's so funny because the learning a good quiche, I remember her, she was one of the first places I went to look for a recipe because I knew she would do it right from so many reasons, of course, knowing the French way and everything, but also because Every quiche I'd made up to a certain point um, looked good, tasted mm -hmm. good, but it didn't taste like the ones that I would eat when I would go to some amazing bakery. Or, and I and I figured out what it is. It's just that I was not using cream. And then of course, Julia okay. pointed me back in the right direction and said, now hold on there. Cream is sometimes, I mean, it, it doesn't have to be in a quiche, but of course the addition of that little bit of extra fat makes it so custardy. And a lot of the French quiches especially are known for being like just that ultimate jiggle custardy situation. The ultimate <laughs> jiggle. Right. No, I completely agree. I, I think that a pretty good quiche is easy to make. Yes. And delicious. But taking it to that next level, uh, I don't, it doesn't require fancy ingredients. It doesn't require anything too complicated. It's just knowing the right things and knowing Absolutely. knowing the right moves to make. So do you want to get started? Yeah, yeah, I do. And I also want to just say that like one of the things for me about quiche, especially now is, um, and I think Julia teaches us this so much, but of course is good ingredients. And one of the things that is the most important to me is the really good eggs. And of course it's great when you can get farm fresh eggs, but um, the, uh, the eggs that I got from Whole Foods today, beautiful brown and speckled. And I just- Thank like, you Whole you know, Foods. So yes, I had to just say like, because specifically, um, you know, you know the sciency thing about the egg that the, the fresher it is, less of an air bubble is attached to the shell. Mm -hmm. And when I popped these open today, they were just like, I was like, okay, 
I think Julia's with us today. She got us the best eggs. She delivered them here. And now we're going to make, you know, really, really beautiful quiche. Okay. Um, so the fresh, the freshest of eggs, because, because tell me now what that translates to in the quiche, that smaller air bubble. What does that mean? Whenever you're dealing with fresher eggs, of course, you're also just dealing with the, the actual fresh taste of the egg, which when it's in its raw state, and we're thinking about that, we're not always thinking about, but one of the things that um, I was, and hopefully it's gonna happen when we crack our next round of eggs as well, just you wanna look for those really, really orangey yolks because the fat is really crucial in the quiche. I mean, Julia Child said fat means flavor. So we, we need to make sure that there's not, I mean, and of course you can make a delicious egg white quiche. You can make all of these things. That is sort of the one way that I modernize it a little bit. Um, it is, this particular recipe is loaded with veggies and the custard is just binding it. And don't get me wrong, I also love a really plain quiche or a cheesy quiche, something that's just pure rich on rich on rich. But what I wanted to do with this recipe is also, you know, make it, if we're using that little bit of cream and we're gonna enjoy this rich custard, let's also enjoy some crunch. Let's also enjoy, and you know, come spring, I just want balance. everything. Yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> I mean, a little bit of balance because to be clear, we still saute the veggies and butter, but you know, <laughs> all in the name of balance. Totally worth it. Okay. So you've got your as fresh as possible eggs. Are they colder yes. or are they at room temperature? I have them at room temperature now, though, of course you can make a quiche custard from cold eggs. One of the advantages of having them at room temperature is that the quiche is going to set faster in the oven which when we're trying to get that perfect jiggle, you know, if you're going from cold down to warm, it's just a slightly different situation. Mm -hmm. I do need to just grab my pie crust really quick. So I'm going to grab that um, just from my fridge right next to me. I'll be right back. Oh, grab your pie <laughs> crust. Okay. So um, we've got room temperature eggs. Now, one question that I sometimes get about room temperature eggs is, you know, it like, how long is it safe to keep them out? When you say room temperature, how long are you putting them out? Um, in your kitchen? Is it okay to keep them out overnight? Is it okay, you know, to put them in the sun to speed up the heating process? You know, what is, what is your, uh, what is your routine for bringing eggs to room temperature? Okay. So this is something, and I don't know, we'll see what the, what the chat says when I say this, but you know, I grew up, it's so funny. You and I also kind of have opposite stories in some way of like, you I grew up in the Yes, I grew up in the country and then ended up in the big city. And like, I, and so like growing up, we had uh, chickens when I was really, really young. And mm -hmm. even when we didn't have chickens, we would have eggs nearby. And um, when you're dealing with really fresh eggs, and especially in America, we're dealing with pasteurized eggs. In my opinion, it is very safe to leave them at room temperature for even several days. Um, mm -hmm. Now, I know not everyone is okay with that. So typically what I would say is, leaving them out overnight the day before you want to bake is going to be sufficient. Um, but if I'm being honest, I have a container of eggs that holds three dozen that sits on my counter at all times. Mm -hmm. And I also am baking a huge quantity of stuff all the time. The but, turnover I mean, is high. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So they are not usually sitting out for, for much longer than a couple of days, but um, especially when I was eating farm fresh eggs a lot, they often weren't even going into the fridge. Like it was really so like we were going and getting them. Yeah, yeah. totally. Um, so anyway, that's, that's kind of my, my feeling on the, on, I, am and I know some people full support of that. Yeah. Well, when we get, um, when we get eggs from our chickens, uh, our chickens are older now. We only probably get one or two every week, but they have this coating on them. That is a protective coating. That's why you're not supposed to wash them before using them. And so, uh, yeah, we keep them out at room temperature and, and then they big up faster. <laughs> Because they're room temperature yes. already. And right. also the the emulsions that we're making in so much baking, right? We're also mm -hmm. able to blend things better and more effectively without batters breaking and all that business. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, they blend in with like with butter nicer and, and all of that. Okay, so you're rolling out dough right now. Oh, we yes. have your your um your counter yeah. camera too. Maybe we so can switch to my counter camera for a little bit while I'm rolling and crimping. So you have got a pie dough that you made in advance. Yes. And this is, I made this this morning, just like for real talk. It's not like it has to be done a day before though. Of course, one of the things that I like about pie, I know people think any kind of pie, um, cause to me quiche is actually one of the most accessible kinds of pie because it's great warm. It's great at room temperature. It's great chilled. Um, 
you know, you can put anything in it. it. It's just really versatile. And to me, it's really simple. So for all those rules that you hear me talking about, like it should be chilled for this long and this long and this long, quiche is something that if I'm being honest, I regularly do move a little faster with just so I can have it for dinner and, and things at my house. Um, and do you and, find it's a little bit more forgiving too because of that? Yes, I especially because of all the excess fat that's in, um, I mean, not excess fat, but because we're dealing with egg yolks and some kind of dairy product and sometimes butter and, and things of that nature. Even if you over bake it a smidge, it's often still going to have a really nice mouth feel. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, uh, an over baked pumpkin pie or cheesecake can, can be kind of dense and tough. And of course, a quiche can get there, but because mm -hmm. we're helping it with so many other ingredients and it's very liquid, it usually still has this nice, um, nice kind of softness. So this might be a gateway pie for somebody who's wanting to dip their toes into the world of pie. Yeah, absolutely. I think so. And I think it's also great. I'm always encouraging people to make more savory pies because I think um, people who learn their pie skills, then, you know, they may not want to eat desserts all the time. And I understand that like we all, I mean, I want to eat desserts all the time, but you know, sometimes you need a break or whatever, but I think savory pies are such a great way and quiche is probably one of the most known savory pies. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I just wanna ask, is my camera, is my countertop phone on the screen? Cause I have flower hands now and I just wanna make Let's sure see. before I- Okay. Oh, they're saying yes, it is now. Okay, I can't see it, but if you guys can. Okay. I'm seeing your you beautiful be face. Okay, so oh, yeah, turn you think, so this is a, so, okay, th this is actually my favorite page in your um, pie book. So uh, tell me I love which- that page. I, I gasped when I saw this page for the first time. Um, you're using a basic pie dough, correct? Yes. All butter. Yes. This is your all butter crust. All butter, baby. All butter, baby. <laughs> and this is um, your your standard go-to. Do you like to, do you prefer to mix by hand or with a food processor or a pastry cutter for this? In the book, I give instructions for all three because I really think things like that are a, per, uh, are a preference. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, I mix by hand because I really think it's the best way to get the feel of everything. Um, and specifically to not over mix or to not, to get the hydration, right. Which is so important. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, this is my all butter dough. And this is actually the extra flaky, which I'm, I'm talking about because this isn't something probably that Julia would have done. And that's one of the reasons why I need to, to call it out. Um, I also have recipe in my book for Pat Brise. And anyone who is looking to, to kind of go for the most foolproof pie dough method, I think Pat Brise, which I learned, you know, how to make Pat Brise from Julia's books. Um, I think Pat Brise is one of the most uh, foolproof and it can be made in the food processor or by hand. And um, because the butter is mixed in really, really finely, it's like mm -hmm. super incorporated into a meal that makes uh, the dough kind of behave a little bit better at all stages. Whereas when you've got the bigger chunks of butter, the payoff is huge later, mm -hmm. but it can get more troublesome to work with. So for people mm -hmm. just getting started, Pat Brise is a great way to go. So, so is, would you, is the, so, the, so the main defining feature of a Pat Brise is much smaller chunks of butter? Yes, it's, a, okay. it's very, you know, fairly finely incorporated, usually kind of into a, a mealy texture. And mm -hmm. when you have that much fat dispersed all throughout the dough in tiny pieces, that puffiness, that flakiness sort of happens naturally as long as the dough is really, really cold. Okay. Um, when you're dealing with the bigger pieces, sometimes what can happen is the butter melting out of the crust and there are ways around all of those things, but that's basically one of the reasons why I say pat brise is a great way for, for a beginner. And for anyone who's um, you know a little bit more advanced or loves to make pie a lot already, then one of the things that I like to use is my extra flaky method, which is just my regular all butter pie dough, but I, I throw one or two folds into it, uh, just rolling out the dough and folding it into quarters. Uh -huh. And it's sort of a, a faux lamination that is, um, you know, really, really simple and quick and just adds an extra 30 minutes, I would say, because of the chill time, mm -hmm. but the results, the payoff, I mean, you're going to see when we slice this other quiche later, it is so flaky. <laughs> so so flaky. very flaky. flaky for days. So we always hear about butter being um, incorporated into pea-sized crumbles. Yes. And so um, Pat is smaller, whereas a flaky... 
it can either be, it kind of depends on the recipe, but it can either be pea sized and smaller or more fully incorporated. It, again, mm -hmm. that might vary from, from recipe to recipe for sure. Um, and then my extra flaky dough, I mix it in a little bit larger, more the size of walnut halves because wow. we are going to undergo these folds that are going to shingle it a little bit further. Wow. Okay. I feel like we could um, talk about size of butter for hours, yes. but I need to um, draw attention to the most soothing, satisfying part, in my opinion, of making a pie, which is these gorgeous crimps that you're making right now. So, um, okay. Since I wouldn't shut up about butter size, can, can I just, can we just talk quickly about what all you just did? So you laid your dough into your pan and then, um, you trim the edges with a scissors. And so one thing that I always forget to do is to leave enough, um, enough overhang to fold it under. And that's so important because look at these gorgeous crimps that you're getting. That is, that's something to, to really pay attention to. So that, that sheet of dough is, is getting quite, quite a bit larger than that pan when you're rolling Absolutely. it Absolutely. So it's about, um, I've already tucked it under, but you can see here the seam. So mm -hmm. I had about an extra half inch of dough over the half inch to an inch, depending on how much of that crust you like at the edge. And having extra crust like this does a few things. First of all, we fold the dough under itself and automatically we've just made more layers at the edge. So when we more slice layers, it, it's going to look, exactly. It just like is going to look so great and people are going to get really crispy, light, airy chunks when they get those um, edge pieces. And then um, it also is helping us with gravity because we're putting a little more crust at the edge, which is giving us more to actually shape. It's going to help the the crimps um, come closer. Someone's asking for a little bit of a close up, and I'll do the best I can. It's at sort of a funky angle, um, but the it's tucked under there. You can see the little seam, um, and then once it's tucked under, you could chill it again, um, or if it's ready to go, you can just start crimping it. And that little bit of excess also makes it so that we've got a little bit of heft here at the sides. So we won't get the dreaded sloping down that often happens and the shrinking that can occur. So very important to have that lip on the pie plate too for that crimping yes. to sit on because yeah, that's sometimes you got a pie plate and there's, it, it's really pretty, but there, there's not a thick enough lip. So that lip is, it does. Um, yes. Having something to rest on just, yeah, from the gravity standpoint again, then that has something to support it. It has some kind of base. But one of the things I will say is, of course, it's possible to bake a pie in something that doesn't have that edge. But if this is a part that you've struggled with, that making sure you find at least a half an inch at the edge is going to be so mm -hmm. like life changing for so many yeah. people. Yeah. And this um, is. Yeah. So I'm crimping. I'm doing my classic finger crimp, which is just. Um, my dominant hand is making the outside shape. So if you were a lefty, you'd go the other way like this. But um, my dominant hand is making kind of a V shape. And then I'm pressing in and down with my uh, pointer finger of my non-dominant hand. And when you're pinching it, are you anticipating any sort of puffing and, and, and rising in the up? Like, are you sort of thinking, okay, I want to pinch this a little bit smaller and tighter than what I ultimately want it to be? Or is this the kind of crust that is going to hold its shape um, exactly? So the flakier the dough is, the less it's going to want to hold its shape. And in my book, I actually have some doughs that I call dough for decor and, um, and some goofy names like that because they're a little Those bit are finer. Pretty pages too. Yeah, they're, they're a little bit finer mixed in. And as a result, um, the dough doesn't just puff up as much. Oh, mm -hmm. yes, there's some dough for decor moments um, and crimping styles. Um, but when uh, the puffing up, we're going to stop it puffing up anywhere that we don't want it to puff up, aka um, the sides here and the base. But I kind of don't mind if it puffs up a little bit here because it might lose a little bit of the definition and you'll see how much definition it still has in my final pie in a second here. But, um, but a little bit of that definition loss, I think is sort of the beauty of pie. You know, it's a little bit of that rustic, but you still want the shape to hold. And as long as it's chilled well enough, it will hold. But the flakier the dough is, the, to answer your question, very 
roundaboutly, <laughs> um, it, it'll puff up more. So these edges are gonna be a little bit puffier than if you were okay. mixing it with Pat Brise or if you were mixing it with a mealy or dough. That is just so beautiful, Erin. And that was Thank so you. satisfying to watch. Okay, now this <laughs> is going into the freezer, into the refrigerator. It went, it went into the refrigerator um, where it's gonna, I prefer a refrigerator chill to a freezer chill. Um, mainly because certain butters um, react differently to um, to that freezer business. And so just to give people the best chance of success, I always say a longer chill time in the fridge, in my opinion, is more preferable to a shorter time in the freezer. But, you know, again, we're talking about quiche. We're talking about maybe making something for weeknight or weekday even. And so I will say, of course, if you want to toss it into the freezer and rush this process a little bit, it's not going to hurt it. Mm -hmm. um, just typically sometimes, especially with larger pieces of butter in the dough, then the butter is going to melt, it has more of a chance of melting out of the dough if it's not handled kind of just right. And is that a, a matter of um, American style butter versus European style butter or what is that can be one on? of the yeah that can be one of the uh, contributing factors. Um, European style butter has closer to a butter content of 82% and American style butter is closer to, um, oh, what's happening here? Sorry, we got a, there we go, we're back. Um, the American butter is closer to 80%. So the, that doesn't seem like a big difference, 2%. I'm like 2% guys, it's not that big of a difference, <laughs> but it actually is because more fat means uh, that it's going to melt easier. So it's a little bit uh, more difficult to work with European butters, but of course they are also so much more flavorful and satisfying in lots of ways because of that extra fat. So mm -hmm. there's definitely like either way that you go, but um, the, I'm sorry, what was the actual, where were we, because I had my phone thing, what was the original question I was trying to answer? This is about um, freezing the butter. So, so Oh yes, yes. Um, the frozen butter, basically what I've found is that if you're, um, oh, and here, I'll just hold this up for now for the, to show you guys ah! my little press. <laughs> this is one that's been par-baked. Um, and you can see it got a little wonky, like up here, it's not totally straight anymore. It's but relatable again, and lovable and looks delicious. I think that's the best part it's about lovely pie. Lovely rustic. Yes. And also it's only par-baked, but look what we can already do. Okay. Okay. So when you par bake your crust, they should be <laughs> that sturdy. Yes, the sturdiness and the par baking. So basically no single crust pie is gonna be able to bake sufficiently. The custard isn't going to bake sufficiently in the time that it takes for the crust to bake. And mm -hmm. also when you'll drown the crust in custard if you don't give it a little bit of a head start. So um, we're, we par baked it at 425 for 15 to 17 minutes with pie weights. And you saw, I just took the pie weights out, but very important that the pie weights come all the way up to the top edge of the crust. But the crust um, doesn't slide down. Exactly, you're not, just, you're not just weighing down the center, you're also supporting the sides. And that's really important. So people who say, my crust shrunk and it slid down the pie plate, a lot of times it didn't actually shrink. It just wasn't supported when you were baking it. And that was really, what was going on more pie weights or, or yeah. just them up against the side um okay so now this cools yes so you want to cool your crust I, I take the pie weights out after you take the pie weights out it's still going to be a little bit of a wet crust in the center so mm -hmm. we return it to the oven for just another two to three minutes then we'll let it cool completely and now we can kind of focus on our filling which is going to happen some back here but i promise i'll bring in some close-ups too um but one thing we're going to do to the crust before because this is something that I always do with quiche, we've got um, some Parmesan cheese and I'm gonna put some Parmesan in the bottom of this. You can I use freshly grated. That. It helps to seal the crust a little bit um, too from the custard, which is so just- So it's almost like, um, cause you know, sometimes there will be that layer of ground nuts or like breadcrumbs at the bottom to act yes. as that barrier. This is blowing my mind right now because I have another, thought to do that with quiche. And so you're getting that moisture barrier and of course, more flavor from the Parmesan. Oh my gosh, yeah, and then we get more it. cheese, which um, is um, yeah. so exciting. Oh. And if you want, you could put that cheese on before you return the um, the pie to the oven for the second par bake and it'll get a little bit crisp on it That's as well. Oh man, it... okay. <laughs> it's Crispy like a free cheese. cheese. <laughs> yes, exactly. Okay. That's <laughs> 
my gosh. <laughs> I wish Julia could see this. When was the I, first time you did that? Were you like, duh? I, yeah, I, honestly, it was one time when I was rushing and that's a great, it's like basically a mistake. I was rushing uh -huh. and I wanted to put cheese on the bottom just for flavor and it melted um, as soon as I put it on. And then I thought, well, what if I just put it in the oven and make like a, a Parmesan crisp in the bottom of the crust? So double crisp. Does it get a little chewy? <laughs> Does it add a little bit of chewiness in between the filling and the crust? I mean, it's such a fine layer that I don't, I don't notice it as much as more like a crispy, salty layer. Um, but, but you know, if you go a thicker layer, I think it could add some chew, I'm which just, is an I'm, interesting. Yeah. I'm just like, it's making me think of, of pot, like, uh, mousse pies with that layer of caramel or chocolate ganache that add that, that new textural excitement oh my god yeah, absolutely well that They're like yeah that wearing. extra <laughs> I wish you were too especially because I'm gonna have two quiches what am I gonna do I'm gonna have to find some friends <laughs> okay I'm All gonna right, chop asparagus. my asparagus yeah it's not gonna be hard for you to find friends Erin <laughs> yeah <laughs> thank you if I could mail you the quiche I would but I fear that um it'll be better to just make you a quiche in person the next time I come to visit come on over <laughs> So we've um, got our asparagus because it's springtime. Yes, and actually this, I was so glad when Cherry Bomb and, and Carrie asked me to make this particular recipe because like it's just the exact right time of year to make it. There's two other quiche variations in my book that are a little less um, hyper seasonal, but I am also making one slight change to this that is super seasonal and fun which is that I actually couldn't find scallions, which I call for in this recipe. So we're using ramps. Ramps? We're using some ramps. Oh, so, <laughs> no, you didn't. I'm, I'm ramped up about it. <laughs> Aaron, this is, this is gonna be some next level quiche. I'm, I'm really, I'm just chopping it into kind of bite-sized chunks. These are, um, this is that source good asparagus and it's, you know, it's gonna be really tender by the time it's done baking. So I like to leave it in kind of bigger chunks. Um, this is just, just to make sure. Bring, yeah, we bring in a pie crust. I I just got my first ramps last night. Oh, I, you did? I didn't sleep because of it because I was trying to figure out what to make, but now you're showing me what to make. <laughs> oh gosh, there's just so many things. Did I ever tell you about the time that I my mom has had never tasted ramps? My mom and dad both. And I was heading to Kansas. It happened to be springtime. So right before I went, I made um, ramp butter and uh, one jar of pickled ramps. And it just you didn't even it. occur to me. Well, I it didn't even occur to me that that was a liquid then. So I was I was trying to carry it on. Oh, and no. no joke, they took no. it from me at security no, and they threw it no. away. And, and I realized my my now husband had to stop me because I was saying to the um, to the the security people is like, please take this to your break room and eat it. Like, yes, so please <laughs> enjoy this pickled gold. This is very special. I know that you won't do that because I'm a stranger, but please oh, do it. <laughs> no. I, the, the, I, I'm getting these visions of you <laughs> chugging ramp brine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got the ramp butter through though, which was good. I got the ramp butter okay, through um, because I had frozen it solid. So it was in my bag and they wouldn't, they didn't take it. So mom still got some ramp butter, luckily. <laughs> so these are some leeks, okay. uh, just one big leek or two smaller ones. My parents grow leeks in their garden. And so I know a lot of, I mean, this is the wrong crowd to say this Ooh. to, but when I first started cooking, I, I used leeks a lot and it's because my parents grew them that I kind of used them with so much freedom. And, yeah. um, and lots of people would ask me when I first started, I know it might be a different story now, but they would always ask me how to use them. And, and I think um, delicate egg dishes or, or more delicate where you still want oniony flavor, something like a quiche is such a great showcase for leeks. I agree. Yeah, I love that you're layering the alliums too because they bring so much flavor, but in my opinion, I mean, the more aliens, the better. Like they, they, they layer so nicely. They're like, totally, <sighs> totally. They're like a subtle perfume that you want to wear, you know, a couple different combinations of just to get different, slightly Absolutely. different flavors that are, that are all very good and, and are, and are really just going to enhance these. Bye. There they are in all their glory. <laughs> Oh, they're just so beautiful. And I was, 
Um, I'm, I'm here with my, my wonderful friend, uh, Erin Clarkson from Cloudy Kitchen. And she was Hi, saying Aaron. yesterday, <laughs> yeah, she's, she's behind the scenes here. Um, she was saying that when she first heard about leaks, since they don't have them, she's from New Zealand. And that since they don't have them, she was wondering why everyone was so freaked out, like why they were so excited about them. And I said that I think one of the things, and I think this is kind of a Julia thing too, uh, of just appreciating the seasons and some of that stuff. And, um, you know, we get ramps before we even get rhubarb. We get ramps before we get a lot of the other spring stuff. So mm -hmm. it's just like this first glorious sign that of the, what's to come. <laughs> of sunnier, longer, warmer days to come. And the smell, that sight of them is, yeah, it's, uh, you know, who, who needs Groundhog Day when you have ramp season? Right, exactly. <laughs> that is the All sign. Right. Oh, I'm I so added my leeks in here and now I'm just going to chop up the ramps a little bit. The only other step I put in this filling is anything green I can find. Okay. <laughs> so we've got some spinach that we'll put in at the end and we've got some peas. Of course, you could use fresh or frozen. I, I was lucky enough to get some fresh today. Um, you don't need to thaw the frozen ones since we're just sauteing them here. And with the ramps, you can go as fine as you want. I usually go um, finer with the stems and a little chunkier with the leaves since they'll wilt a lot. And the whole part of the, the ramp too, right? Yes, I mean, except for the very end and, and be sure to clean them really, really, really well. That's one of the biggest things with ramps um, over something like scallions is there's so, I mean, first of all, they're wild, but second of all, there's just, they're a leak, a wild leak and there's so much dirt hiding inside all of those things. So cleaning them really well. And I always joke that the cleaning is kind of a torturous process because they smell so good and yeah. you're like, you're like, oh, but first I must clean them. <laughs> but yeah, you've got to do it since they're wild. Yeah. You never know if an animal has, you know, come and. Oh, well that for sure. That and and all that dirt, they're just such, um, cause they grow, their whole thing is that they grow, um, before the canopy of the forest comes in. Right. So they, they're growing in, you know, I dense wooded of, areas. I never thought about that. That's so that's how that's when the time is to find them. And the, you know, there are all those, these are like some of the things that my 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 family taught me a little bit too, because there's another one that's when the lilacs are blooming, that's when you should look for morels. <laughs> Wait, okay, so, so so is that why <laughs> ramp season is so limited? Because they have to grow before the trees grow. Absolutely. That is why it's so limited. And it's also why it can be harder to predict because like I don't know what it's like. Um, where you are right now, but it's been kind of a funky spring here. And, um, you know, when it's kind of, there was really warm weather and stuff started blooming and then it snowed. And, you know, mm -hmm. like when those yeah. kinds of things happen, that can be more detrimental for the ramps um, in terms of, you know, they just might get stunted or there may not be as many of them. They might be really tiny, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. So, mm -hmm. but this was a good year for ramps is my understanding on the East oh, Coast. Good. So. <laughs> it's early. Is it an earlier year? Well, it's already, we've already had, like I said, some warmth. So it's, yeah. I, I think that's what it was, is it was a little bit of a jump start, but it was the same thing. I don't know. I have all these beautiful flowering trees in my neighborhood and they always bloom kind of at the same times. And this year they bloomed several weeks early. So if we're going by the magnolia trees, then yes, I think, I think that it was an early year for everything. Ramps too. Okay. So in goes the spinach. Yep, and so this is actually a good um, lesson of, uh, you know, I always, when I'm making savory stuff, I like to cook a lot of the ingredients first because there's so much moisture in these. So again, you absolutely could pile raw spinach and raw asparagus into a pie crust, but they're gonna leach a lot of moisture. Yeah. And you have a potential then to water down your custard, to not mm -hmm. have it be seasoned right. Mm -hmm. And also, um, this is another way for the people that think that pie is such a long process. It's another way to break it up because you could make this mixture, pop it in the fridge, make your pie dough, pop it in the fridge. And then the next day, just be ready to kind of assemble much, a much easier kind of sure. portion. So, this, so, so what you're doing right now might be if somebody wanted to make a quiche for a Sunday brunch, you could do this on a Saturday night and then Sunday morning, just dump and bake. Absolutely. In fact, that is what I would do. And that's how I bake a, um, you know, um, the amazing Michelle Lopez, the author of Weeknight Baking. I love the way that she divvies up in her book, things like that, because I think that's one of the things that's yeah. different from like Julia era of cookbook writing 
to now is that we are often trying to think of with some of these more complex recipes, Julia was trying to convince us to try them. I think now we're trying to convince people as food creators to figure out how to work them into your actual life. That a quiche doesn't have to be a special project. It can be an anytime kind of thing. What a fascinating observation of just, yeah, this arc of cookbook writing about what um, what the focuses have have shifted to because yeah Julia was introducing this whole new world and and now now we're in the world and and we're we're working it into our crazy busy lives I love that and also that's it's it's a different thing because we you know we have we have all that knowledge that we have from her now um you know the the things the words that are just in our vocabulary because of Julia Mm -hmm. um you know the french terms or the the specific meals and and all of those things that kind of stuff it's like we're not always starting from scratch anymore people like julia and of course she's not the only one the amazing article in the julia issue by abina about i mean we've got so so many people that have paved this way so that now the work that we get to do as food creators i think is just fun <laughs> i mean they did they did a lot of the hard work for us of like convincing people to try things. And I mean, there's still a long, long way to go, but mm -hmm. I think there's so much of that. Um, she was trying to take people who were eating largely convenience foods and trying to teach them to cook from scratch. And mm -hmm. now we have the advantage of, of being able to say, okay, well, here's some easier things to cook from scratch, but also like during the pandemic, if you're ready for a project, like so many people right. exactly. <laughs> have been, then and, and of course we, and, and we, we also have access to so many varied and new ingredients, whether it is a convenience ingredient or um, different spices from different parts of the world, different, um, that's, it's so vibrant and green. That's oh, my favorite green. color. Look at, it's so bright. That just screams spring. So could somebody use frozen spinach? Absolutely, and frozen peas too. With the frozen spinach, make sure you just uh, thaw it first and squeeze it out really, really well. Mm -hmm. Um, and you wouldn't even have to, you could just stir it in at the end. Same with the frozen peas. Since I used fresh, I, I sauteed them for a few minutes, but, um, but if you're using frozen, you could kind of just toss that and the frozen spinach in at the end. And that is definitely a way I would make something like this in the winter, maybe even without the asparagus is kind mm -hmm. of maybe even throw some frozen green beans in it or something that I had from the summer, whether I was lucky enough to freeze them myself. Sometimes I go pick peas and so I freeze the good peas for a little while. Oh yeah, we got a good color. I hope this is That's as a coming bright through. Orange. I was just so excited when I cracked them this morning. I was like, yes. That's Julia's gorgeous. watching over our eggs. <laughs> Hello, Julia. <laughs> um, have you ever put anything in a quiche that you regret putting in a quiche? <laughs> wow, that's the best question I've maybe been ever asked. Um <laughs> I uh, I think the only thing I ever regretted, and when I say regret, it, it, you have to bear with me for the story because I regretted it as I was digesting it a little bit, but I did not regret it when I was eating it. I made a cheese, a very heavily laden cheese quiche, kind of like think of Julia's cheese souffle kind of a moment, but in a flaky crust. So we had all of that business going on and, um, and it was just, it was so good. It was so good that I, I know that feeling pieces. Yeah, I, it was so good. And then as soon as I took the last bite of the second piece, I had made a huge mistake. You know, it was oh, like, no, just, what have I it was done? Delicious. And I will tell you that that, that recipe altered to not be quite as decadent. It's still plenty decadent, but it's not quite that much. It is in my book, the, the cheese lovers the piece. Few, and yeah, I, I right took it down a few notches uh, to make it <laughs> more. So there, is, uh, so there is such a thing as too much cheese in a quiche. This is I mean, I'm sure enough. there's, I'm sure there's bomb squad members who would go to the mat with me on that, but <laughs> about too much, too well, much. You, you um, want to be cheese. able to taste the the egginess and the veggies and for and sure. All that. Okay, in goes the cream. And there's milk in here too. So I will say that you know you can use half and half. If you only had milk, you can just use milk. And we talked about how that might affect the texture. Mm -hmm. um, and if you only have cream, you know you could just use cream too. I'd be good with that. Um, there's definitely however you want to do that. And then we'll season this custard with some salt and pepper too. 
but that's how easy a quiche custard is, is just some eggs and um, yeah, so easy peasy. Amazing. Okay. And then I will say um, I would normally let this vegetable mixture cool a little bit more. And the only reason is if we put something hot into the crust, there could be a little bit of steam um, with, with uh, it could just make the crust a little soggy, but never fear, it would be kind of sogifying it from the inside and it is going back into the oven. So- Sogifying um, it. <laughs> I think basically um, it, it could make it a little bit soggy, but as long as it's not piping hot and literally steaming, it should be fine. Again, we've got that protective cheese layer and anytime you've par baked, you've set the structure enough and it's gonna go back into the oven and re-crisp. So okay. if we do, a, if we're rushing it a little bit this time, but again, if you were doing this for company or like in an imaginary, what would you cook for Julie if she came for dinner situation? Um, you know, you would maybe want to let this question, cool entirely. <laughs> um, <laughs> we would definitely it, let it cool. Is it a fear that the hot vegetables might start to cook the egg prematurely or you're not concerned with that? No, it definitely needs to cool enough that we're not gonna cook the egg immediately upon okay. contact, but even just the little bit of time it took for us to whisk the custard is probably enough time for that. We, okay. But what we would do is if we pile, you'll see how much veggie is actually in this when we put it in, because it comes up to here. And if that's really packed in tight, right next to the crust, you know, if, there's, if it's still steaming, that steam won't have anywhere to go except to kind of leach moisture into the crust. So that's okay. really all we'd be trying to avoid, aside from, of course, cooking the egg quickly. But um, if you're okay. doing this at home and you don't want to add it just yet, literally just another five or 10 minutes will probably be enough for this to be just ready go, to go. Go pick some peas. Exactly. Come back, <laughs> pick some lilacs for the table. Exactly. Find some morels uh, in the woods and <laughs> <laughs> all that business. So this, okay. So this is going in and. Um, do you, do you have a rule of thumb if somebody wanted to just switch up the vegetables? Are you looking for a level, uh, like an amount of vegetables to fill up into the, your pie crust before adding your, uh, your custard mixture? Yeah, or that's, kind that's of a great question. Um, I like a lot of inclusions in quiche, but, but the main thing to note is that no matter how much you wanna put in, whether you just want a layer of roasted tomatoes in the bottom, whether you just want some pieces of kale kind of poking out of the top, whatever you do, um, the main thing to be aware of is that the less inclusions, the more of this custard you're gonna need. So right. like this, this quantity that I'm working with, um, you know, if, if I took out the asparagus and I took out the spinach, I might need another egg or two to fill this up to the same level. Um, and it's, that's, as, it's as easy as that. Just, oh, just add another egg. Would you want to add a little bit more heavy cream or milk or? I mean, yes, I would, but you also totally wouldn't have to. That's kind of one of those things of like, um, you know, personal preference, but usually for every egg, I would just add another tablespoon or two of dairy, um, you know, to help keep that mixture a little bit looser too, you know, all of that. This is, I have to say, Erin, this is such a refreshing approach to baking because there is that perception that baking has to be exactly precise and everything has to be leveled off exactly and, and it has to be um, just, you know, no straying. But with something like this quiche, there is that wiggle room to, to, to make it your own, to have fun with it and, and also to relax and to enjoy Absolutely. It. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's one of the things that, um, you know, that again, if we're talking about making mistakes, we're talking about some of the things about Julia, that really is, like I said, it's a huge part of what I took away from her. But it's also like, if you want to eat well, if you want to cook well, um, you know, not every day you're going to be able to make, you know, the five course meal with multiple components. And, you know, I'm sort of known for being <laughs> kind of extra with my baked goods from the perspective of I like to show people a lot. So I'm not just going to make oh, one pie. We, I'm we are make all <laughs> better and more knowledgeable for it, Erin. Thank you. But I also will say that when the way that I cook at home, the way that I bake when it's just me and, you know, my family and my loved ones, it's a lot more like this. 
And actually, I haven't like formally talked about this yet, but I am working on a new cookbook and the new cookbook is gonna be a, a lot of this kind of stuff. So I'm excited um, to share that with you guys when the time comes. <laughs> when When is the release date? Uh, it'll come out next fall. The comment section is blowing up right now. <laughs> I'm it's, so excited. Um, I'm not quite going to release the the full topic yet, but what I will say is it's a lot of things. It's not just dessert. You put it that way. <laughs> That's exciting. very exciting. Um, can we talk about hey, the we're ready. that you just put on top? Yes, let's talk about the cheese because there's two kinds. I put a little more of that Parmesan on top. And then I also did with quiche, I really like, um, you know, Gruyere or something of that nature, but also like a really good sharp cheddar is great. Mm -hmm. And if you want, I like to use a uh, firmer cheese because then you can get this like grated over the top and it'll brown and golden really beautifully. Wow. But one of my other favorite things to do are to use really soft cheeses and just kind of plop them in. So like ricotta or goat cheese, and then whoever gets the like piece with a really big clump, it's like a king cake almost. It's like, <laughs> yes, I got the goat cheese. Better than a plastic baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there's plenty of cheese on the top. And of course, that's the kind of thing also, I had Parmesan on the bottom. I have this cheese on the top. If you're not wanting to do the cheese, then you could also leave this off. It's gonna be a very flavorful quiche without it. But one of the things that I like that it does is add that little bit of brownness to the surface and almost like a crisp top layer without a top crust. <laughs> I'm telling you, I am learning things about quiche that I never could have imagined. I, I always mix the cheese into my quiche, but the idea of putting it on top to get that crust is brilliant. Well, and I think mixing it in is also like when I make a cheese quiche, I would mix it in and put it on top because then it's like, what I like about mixing it in is that it's distributed throughout, which yeah. is so lovely. But also with something like this, then you get, you know, kind of a similar amount in almost every bite. And then the other thing that I will say, I, I didn't do it this time, but you know, sometimes people sprinkle sugar on the outside of crust to give it, when I'm making savory pies, I do Parmesan on the outside of the crust and, or, you know, and it's just like, it browns and gets crispy and it's just like, ah. Okay, so <laughs> it's time for the oven now? Yeah, I'm gonna put this guy in the oven. And you know, I've never baked, I'm, I'm at, some, I'm at a house that's not mine and I've never baked in this oven before I baked the pie this morning and it turned out great. So let me go oh, grab how, What do you, um, how do you adjust for that? Because, uh, you know, we always tell people to get the uh, thermometers to stick in the oven to make sure that it's accurate. Is that something you pack in your suitcase when you're going to an Airbnb <laughs> or do you, do you just work on the fly? I definitely have have packed a um, oven thermometer with me when I've gone to an Airbnb before. I did not this time. Does not surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> I did not this time, um, but I do. Um, I do like to. Uh, you can test something first, and one of the easiest things to do is if you got a piece of bread or something, like do the toast test. Okay. But this was the thing I knew about this oven when I opened it. It appears to me that perhaps this oven has never been used. <laughs> It is a brand new oven, you know, of some sort. It's okay. I've never seen an oven so clean on the inside and except in the store. So, uh -huh. um, <laughs> so the, I knew though, usually a brand new oven is typically fairly even heat. So I did kind of get lucky this time, but pies always have a lot of character. So, uh, you know, even if you get a little bit of a toastiness on one part and people ask me about those pie crust shields for when you're par baking, sometimes those edges can brown more. Yeah. I usually just use foil, but the other thing that I recommend that you, you need to know a little bit more about baking to like get the hang of this, mm -hmm. but when your crust, say you're baking the quiche and the temperature is 375 or 350, if your crust starts browning too much, you can just knock the temperature down 25 degrees and it's gonna take the filling longer to set, but it's going to slow the browning of the crust. So. Okay most fillings are gonna actually benefit from being baked a little slower in terms of the filling, like a custard low and slow is kind of lovely. So I didn't have to do that today. Um, and, and again, it's out of the, the wow. pan here. Could you move it down an oven rack if it's browning too much? Absolutely. So I actually like to bake my pies towards the bottom of the oven to help get the crust crisper. Mm -hmm. And then that also does help protect it from being too close to the top and browning too much. 
which which is really great yes. too. Look at that beauty. Ooh, should I cut him or yes, her? You should. <laughs> <laughs> we'll name her oh, Julia. Um. You, so you've let this cool for a little bit because yes. it's cutting nicely. Yes, it has been cooling. When do you think I took this out of the oven, Erin? Like two hours ago? Yeah, maybe a little before, maybe two and a half hours. It's been a little bit, but. Okay. Mm. Okay. Mm. The sturdy pie uh, challenge. Hello. <laughs> uh, so loaded with veggies. That's really my favorite part about this particular quiche is how That's loaded awesome. with veggies it is. That's gorgeous. And, and the veggies stayed so bright and green. Yeah, and that's kind of because they're protected. Okay, here, I'm trying to get oh, to wow. the- Oh, wow, oh, wow, okay, yep, I'm seeing those layers. That's the flaky AF-ness that we like to see. Mm -hmm. That's the perfect <laughs> bite, that's, it's that corner that yes. has extra flakiness, but you're also getting some of the filling, the end bites. Yes, bite. I was gonna say, if um, if they can put the camera back on my face, I'll, I'll eat it in front of all of you and make you mad. <laughs> I mean, assuming you want that. Erin, this looks it. incredible. I wish I could smell it. It does smell very um, rampy in here now, which I'm, so I actually normally eat, Amazing. I a lot like pizza and I don't even use a fork, but um, because this didn't cool all the way, and I, I know you, I've talked about this spiel a lot, even here on Cherry Bomb before, but um the cooler it is, the easier it's going to be to slice. So the firmer it is, the the more set it's going to be. So typically, once it was totally cool, I could just pick it up and eat it like a pizza. But I am going to use a fork today, especially because I don't want to stain my my cherry shirt. <laughs> and we're all just going to sit here and watch you. Oh my god! And live vicariously through you, and just pretend that we're tasting those ramps and the oh cheese and the two layer, the crispy cheese on top, and then the parmesan on the bottom. The thing that I like about the the most is the um <laughs> my Erin's coming. She the other Erin is here. Erin, let's watch two Erin's <laughs> eating quiche. Hi, Erin. <laughs> two Erin's eating quiche. <laughs> um, um, I'm I'm saying hi. I'm hi, jumping Carrie. back in. Hello. I want to ask some of the audience questions, but Molly, yes. you had a question. It looked like you're about to ask a question, so go ahead. Oh well. I wanted to get to the question about what you would serve this with if you were serving it to Julia. I would serve this with a humongous, really acidic green salad, mm. a very elaborate cheese plate. <laughs> and what else, what else would I have with it? I mean, honestly, that What's would probably dessert? be, oh, dessert. That's a great question. So one of the other, and Dessert, I think, would be just because it is the season and it would go well. I wonder if Julia would roll her eyes if I made her two pies, because I think I would make her my pure rhubarb pie. <gasps> oh, that sounds like that sounds like the perfect meal. Erin. I'm inviting myself over for that meal. I, I wouldn't worry about the double pie situation. I ran and found a head wrap because I was feeling I was having Welcome. head wrap. <laughs> Join us. Up. So now I feel much better. OK, I've got a few questions for you. Um, Aaron, again, mind blown. Every time I see one of your pie demos, I just uh, never even knew you could pick up a pie and have it be so sturdy <laughs> until I have learned all of this from you. So thank you for just being a game changer for all of us. Um, your book is coming out, did you say fall of next year? Yeah, fall or of 2022. Oh, <laughs> I'm oh, still writing it. Wait, so next so long. We have to wait yeah, so It long. is a long time. And it's I haven't even told anyone else about it yet, but I got to tell breaking the news. squad. Yeah, I got to, you know, this is like friends. We got to, we got to talk about the exciting oh. stuff. <laughs> and then Molly, you have a book coming out in the fall, don't you? Yeah. It's no, same, same as Aaron, fall 2022. Next year? Oh, wait, we're going to have a party. Uh, book tour party? Oh. <laughs> book party, book party. We'll, yes. we'll host the, we can host the party if you let us. So I yeah. oh, um, love this plan. Okay, well, it's a good, it's it's now we have something to look forward to in fall of 2022. <laughs> uh, okay, Molly, you had mentioned that you saw the Julia Child exhibit at the Smithsonian. Can you tell us about your visit? It was this feeling that I didn't expect it. I got emotional. Her kitchen is preserved in the Smithsonian. 
Um, you see her pegboard that Paul built for her. And it is, and, and you can peek in at different angles. And it's truly magical. Her, her pots and pans are there. Um, it, it was, it was, a, it was a while ago, but my gosh, I, it took my breath away. Um, and, and then I, I also got to see her kitchen in France, which was very similar wow. because it also had the pegboard. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and you could, you could really feel her. It was this wow. iconic space and I would highly recommend checking it out at the Smithsonian or going to La Peach and and taking a class there because you can you can take cooking classes in her in her old house in France it's so wow, amazing magical and the Smithsonian uh just announced their reopening so the museums all the museums that make up the Smithsonian have been amazing. closed but they are reopening in May so if anyone wants to go visit you can go online and check that out okay Erin of course we have a million questions so Hit let's me. <laughs> a few of these, a lot of them are about tools and techniques. Folks want to know your preference for a pie pan, material um, and brand, if you don't mind saying. If you really want to do the sturdy pie challenge, one of the best pie pans is a metal pie plate from USA Pan. Lots of different stores sell it. King Arthur Baking sells it. Boeing Sonoma sells it. Lots of people do. And it's actually also one that I like to re recommend because it averages retail about 15 bucks. So I know a lot of pie plates that we covet are the you know really nice expensive ceramic ones, but metal is one of the most non-stick. So some ceramic are really non-stick, but others that have a more matte appearance can get stuck. So if you're really wanting to like triumphantly lift the pie out of the pie plate, that $15 pie pan is the one for you. Okay, uh, how about a rolling pin? Do you have a rolling pin you recommend? I do, um, the, what, oh gosh, what's his, what's the name of our rolling pin guy? I'm so sorry, I always, <laughs> Tom Nuck, Tom Nuck, T-O-M-N-U-K. Um, okay. They're beautiful um, uh, tapered rolling pins, handmade, they come in different woods and finishes. Um, it is a French style pin without handles. And I do think that rolling pins are a personal preference. I know lots of great bakers who use pins with handles. So if that feels better to you, then that's the other one that I will recommend again, because of price point, because the Tom Nook one is, it's a mate, it's a fine maker kind of product. So it's, you know, he makes them all himself. Um, but I really like the one from Food 52 as well, because it comes with the the rolling, um, the silicone rings on the end to help guide your thickness. And okay. it is, um, it's a much lower price at like $40. So that's a really nice kind of starter piece where you're getting extra for your buck also. Great. Molly, are you a French rolling pin or handles? I love French rolling pins. The one that I use is seven inches. Uh, I just, I like the control that I can get, but yeah, all French all the way, just the taper. Okay. Yeah, I love the so taper. much control. Absolutely. All right, Melissa Hellman would like to know, Erin, why roll your dough in a rectangle when your pie pan is round? Why not roll? So, it good question. Part of that is because I was going quickly, uh, as you know, not rotating it quite often enough. But the other reason is because this dough was folded. I tried to get it back into a round shape, but you know how they always say, if you start with a circle, you'll end with a circle. I kind of started with more of a rectangle shape because I had folded the dough. So it was rounded. I tucked the corners under, but as I rolled it out, it, it has a tendency to do that. And because I was enjoying chatting with Molly so much, normally one of the ways that I get to avoid that is by rotating the dough often while I'm rolling it out. And when you see it starting to square off, just pushing back to make more of that circular shape, it's another advantage of the tapered pin. You can just apply pressure where you need to instead of over the whole dough. All right, this is a fun comment from Paula. My mom baked a ton of pies for a restaurant every day and used a stockinette sleeve over the rolling pin. What was that all about? Do you know? Oh, interesting. Um, that could have been a non-stick thing, actually, um, to attempt to use less flour because, you know, some kind of protection, um, depending on the material of the pin, you know, as the fat warms up, it really likes to stick to the pins. It likes to stick to every, the counter. But a lot of bakers like to use as little flour as possible because the more flour you're using, obviously, the more is it getting incorporated into the dough. And for pie dough in particular, that can make it a little bit more brittle. It can make it a little tougher in the end. So that could have just been a, a nonstick thing. Yeah, someone in the comments is saying it's nonstick. My grandma did that too. <laughs> 
Uh, how about spring form pans? Can you make a quiche in a spring form pan? Oh, heck yes. In fact, there's a whole section in the book on pie about how pie plates are just one of the only things you can bake in. I bake pies in tart pans. I bake pies in cake pans. I bake pies in cast iron skillets. Uh, you know, the, the, as long as it's got a crust and a filling, it's a pie. So spring form <laughs> pan is, is a great way to go. Okay. And conversion, uh, since you said you were using scallions in the recipe, but you had beautiful ramps, so use them instead. Uh, ratios, can you use the same amount? I actually used about two ramps for every one scallion because the, the ramps I had were kind of smaller, but if you had ramps that were the size of scallions, you could kind of just do one to one. Also, if you've got ramps, you may want to use more of them just because it's so fun when they're in season. So you could also take the leeks out and use a whole bunch of ramps. That would be delicious too. Okay. Um, Amalia wants to know, for this veggie quiche, would a little bit of fresh lemon juice or zest help, or might it interfere with the egg custard and curdle it? Oh, definitely not. You could definitely put a little bit of that flavor in there. I would say I would find it more favorable to add it to the vegetables and then put the vegetables in and pour the custard over. Because of course, if you do add some directly to the egg custard, it, it could be problematic in that sense. But if you add it into the vegetables, it shouldn't be a problem. Okay. And then we've got a few, dough qu a few more dough questions, of course. If you use sugar as a pie weight, is there anything you can do with the sugar after it bakes? Yeah, absolutely. That's Stella Parks method. It's one of the best out there in terms of, you know, that panicking feeling of I don't have pie weights uh, or I don't have beans, I don't have whatever. Because if you're making a pie, you often would have sugar. So I love her technique for doing that. I know she uses foil instead of parchment um, because it's a little bit sturdier since the sugar, you need so much sugar that it can be quite heavy. Um, and the sugar is totally safe to use afterwards in any application you want. And I would definitely recommend checking out Stella's work since that she has lots of recipes that specifically use it. All right. The Molly, toasted sugar. What's your pie weight preference? Oh, I love the Stella Parks toasting sugar, but I probably go for the, um, the, like the expired dried beans from the bed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, Erin. Uh, last question, what knife are you using? Because I know we talked a lot about how to cut. You you just go in so fearlessly with the <laughs> knife on the pie. It's, um, this is a material brand knife, material. I think you guys know some of them. It, my husband um, loves to sharpen knives. I married a good one and he just like loves keeping them sharp. So the other thing people are always like, what knife is that? What knife is that? And I always say, it, in this case, I do love this knife. It's a great knife. But in this case, it's not just the knife. It's my husband, Derek. <laughs> you know, it's funny. You were quoting Julia Child earlier. And I was just thinking of you and how fearlessly you go in and you cut the pies. And, um, and I do it so gingerly, which I think was the problem. There's that wonderful Julia quote where she says, you have to have the courage of your convictions for all yes. things cooking, yes. slicing pies. I think that was the tossing potatoes episode where if you haven't seen yes. that, fun. she is tossing potatoes and they spill all over and she blames herself and said she did not have the courage of her convictions to toss <laughs> potatoes properly. I know. And yeah, she, I love how she puts that back on herself. And I, I was actually just saying this this morning that my real attachment to Julia, now that I have done some things on camera, which is not anything I ever thought I was going to do necessarily, um, I'm not afraid of messing up the same way that I think I would have been if I didn't watch a lot of Julia, like, mm -hmm. because messing up actually some of the mistakes, I, I actually highlight mistakes in my videos because I think that that's one of the best points to learn from. And she has that great quote too about, um, it's like drama is very important in the kitchen and anything can be dramatic if you do it right, even a pancake. <laughs> And I love that because it's like anything, we could just make like the most romantic dinner and just make a waffle and it could be the best thing. <laughs> that is true, that is true. Um, all right, Molly, I'm going to have you, let you have the last word. You asked Erin what she would serve uh, Julia. What would you serve Julia if she was coming to the farm? Oh my gosh, if Julia was coming to the farm, I would obviously uh, go to my local fishmonger and get a whole monkfish. <laughs> <laughs> No, I love the I, I love the idea of quiche. Oh, definitely something from the farm. So um our rhubarb is coming up. We have our apple trees, we have the eggs from our chickens. So my gosh, I would be so scared. I would I'd be very nervous, but I would want to showcase local food. I think a hot dish. Oh, she would love your hot dish. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> 
Well, you two are two of the most delightful human beings I know, and I know the Bomb Squad knows. So thank you so much for doing this together. And uh, I hope we get to see you cook together again, hopefully before fall 2022. <laughs> and in person maybe then. <laughs> and in person. Next year in real life. <laughs> that would be amazing. Well, thank you again to the two of you. Thank you to everyone out there who watched uh, this wonderful demo. It was so much fun. We do have the Julia Jubilee is almost over, which is so sad. Um, we do have a panel happening at 4 p.m. EST for all you cookbook lovers out there. It's going to be about um, cookbooks from Julia's time to today. So be sure to tune in if you love cookbooks or a cookbook collector. And then tomorrow we have our final panel, which I'm moderating, that's all about Julia's legacy. So I would love for all of you to tune in. I think that's three o'clock tomorrow. Uh, yes, three o'clock EST tomorrow. We have a wonderful panel with folks like um, Tanya Holland and Dory Greenspan, and you don't want to miss that. Uh, lastly, I want to thank our friends at Whole Foods for supporting, at Whole Foods Market, for supporting Cherry Bomb and all of our Jubilees. You've been remarkable and your support is so appreciated. And don't forget, I want you all to look for the Sourced for Good logo next time you are at a Whole Foods. All right. Um, that's it for now, everybody. Uh, you are the bomb. Head over to Cherry Bomb. Check out the rest of the schedule, and you can find Aaron's recipe there as well. I know a lot of you were asking about that. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Bye, Aaron. Bye, Bon Molly. appetit. <laughs>